Hi everyone, apologies for the delay. We're just having a few technical technology issues as per usual. Um, so I'll just get started in a moment. Uh, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes just while we're waiting for a few more people to join. We can see some more people just logging on currently. Okay, Sarah, I think we're starting to get a few more people there. Do you want to kick it off shortly? Yep, sure can. Thanks, Brett. So welcome everyone to our Central Tablelands Pasture Quality Webinar. My name is Sarah Island and I'm joined today by Senior Land Services Officer Brett Littler and Phil Cranny. Before we begin, I'll just quickly explain how to interact with us during this webinar. So the best way to interact with us is to watch from your computer um, as you'll be able to ask questions through the Q&A section. You can find this on the top right hand side of your screen. There should be a Q&A button. If you click that, a bar will open and this is where you'll be able to type your questions. This is also where other questions will be posted. If you see a question there that you're interested in, you can vote for that question to put it higher on the list. We'll be keeping everyone on mute, so if you have anything to ask, please pop it in the Q&A section at any time during the presentation. We will then answer them as time allows at the end, and if we aren't able to get through all the questions tonight, we'll send out a document after the webinar. Apologies, sorry, just having more issues. One moment, sorry everyone. Um, so over the past two months, we've taken over 110 pasture cuts uh, throughout 20 different localities in the region. We've taken a range of pasture cuts ranging from unimproved to improved pastures, um, and the re results have been collated into a full results table, which we'll be sending out after the webinar. The purpose of this project is to see how our, our pastures are testing in spring for the central tablelands. As you can see, we visited a wide range of different pastures in the region. So if we didn't get around to testing your pastures this time, hopefully we've tested something similar. Our full results will be sent out to everyone after the webinar in a format like this. The results will include all the tested parameters, location of cut and type of pasture. We've also added a productivity indicator as seen on the right with green, yellow and red highlights. This shows how the quality of the pasture will impact livestock perform performance, whether it be growth, maintenance or loss of productivity. This graph shows the digestibility curves for both temperate and tropical pastures with digestibility on the left and energy on the right. 
Regardless of whether we're dealing with temperate or tropical species, the same principle applies. Digestibility and energy content is at its highest point when plants are young and in their early stages of their growth cycle, and decline when plants mature and go into their reproductive phase. During spring, longer daylight hours, warmer soil temperatures and higher rainfall conditions cause more rapid pasture growth. This results in pastures moving through the growth stages at a faster rate. With this in mind, it's important to note that the pastures we sampled vary in their growth stage. They range from active growth all the way up into late flowering stage. We can expect to see the temperate pastures ranging in digestibility from 55 to 80% and tropicals ranging from 45 to 75% digestible, depending on the stage of growth. As a reference point, cardboard is about 45% digestible. Looking forward to the rest of November, in the tablelands, we would normally expect to see temperate pastures in their late to early flowering, late vegetative to early flowering stage. Whereas temperate pastures in the slopes would normally be in their mid to late flowering stage at this time. The table on the right illustrates the minimum energy and protein limits for maintenance, lactating, growing and finishing livestock. This table is very useful when considering how livestock will perform in a paddock and is what we use to create the productivity key for our full results. We can compare this table with the ranges of nutritional values that we found in our results. We can see a trend within the tables on the left where grazing crops have the highest levels of protein, energy and digestibility. They are then followed by the improved pastures and lastly, the un unimproved pastures. The ranges and results show a large variance. This is due to many reasons, including fertilizer application history, legume percentage, growth stage, grazing history, and whether the sample is dead or green. A good example of this is the protein percentage in the unimproved pasture, which ranges from 3.3 to 19.3%. We'll be talking a lot about digestibility today as it is a very important consideration. But in case you're unfamiliar or need a refresher, I'll quickly go over what, what that means. Digestibility is the proportion of feed consumed, which is used by the animal. So if we take a look at this illustration, if a pasture is 70% digestible and the animal consumes 10 kilograms of dry matter, meaning we take out the water content, three kilograms of that pasture will come out the other end and hence the animal utilizes seven kilograms. So 10 kilograms in, seven kilograms used, and three kilograms wasted. Energy followed by protein are generally the most limiting factors. Energy is the most important indicator of the quality of feed. This is because the energy is not only required for maintenance, but growth, muscle development, and fat storage as well. Protein is also required for the development of muscle, wool production and drives the appetite of stock. If there is a lack of protein in the diet, other issues will arise such as reproduction, such as reduction in gut bacteria, a slow in digestion and a drop in intake. Despite the importance of the two, all the elements seen on this screen are required in the right balance. Phil will now look at our quality results and key findings. Great, thanks Sarah. Uh, hoping you jagged a storm there this afternoon over there in Mudgee. Good to see. So Sarah's uh, loose and the king of fodder right up the front here, which is fantastic at Spices Creek. They've got a, uh, a little pasture trial. Central West Local Land Services are running a little pasture tr trial there at Spices Creek. So obviously loose and grown throughout the tablelands and a beautiful crude protein percentage of 37.6 and that energy 12.5. That particular variety of lucerne is a uh, winter active variety. And if you want to know a bit more about how they perform some of these varieties of lucerne, you can jump onto the pasture trial network and check out the nearest uh, species trial near you. And there's a few of those particular varieties in the Cowra trial which actually did quite well, especially in that autumn period where you're trying to build that feed wedge before winter. Uh, the vetch over there at Woodstock, uh, 
quite interesting that particular grower has that uh, fairly normal canola wheat rotation but does try a few pulses and grazing vetch uh, he commented to me that it is a bit of a balance between getting that vetch at that full canopy stage to control those weeds in those paddocks um, in, a, in a rotation cropping rotation but also not not too much uh, shading because it does encourage uh, disease so yeah, interesting um, example of, of vetch being used in a grazing situation in cropping country obviously that vetch if it grows five ton of dry matter for every ton of dry matter it's should be pumping in at least 25 to 30 kgs of nitrogen into that soil. So well over 120 kgs of nitrogen you should expect after a, a decent vetch crop like this one, for example. And I guess at this point, Brett, you might want to comment a little bit on that crude protein. It is probably a little bit high. Is there anything else you'd like to say on an animal performance side of things? Yeah, look, Phil, definitely it's up there. The energies are very good at 12.5 and, and 13.2. Uh, what I would say is it's definitely up there. We sort of, depending on the fractions of protein, we talk about anything over 22% starts to actually uh, cost us a little bit of performance and there's an energy cost for the extra protein going through the system being excreted out and the like. Uh, but in saying that, um, we're still looking at animals that are going to be grazing and performing and, and putting on a lot of weight gain. The fact that the legumes, uh, their intakes are going to be up. Uh, so, yes, yeah, still going to perform quite well. But, yeah, it's just something to, to, to think about. But what I would say uh, is that we do, we're only taking a snapshot on the day. Um, and we do see that these protein percentages can vary greatly throughout a whole grazing season. So later on, as it starts to mature, we'll see some of those proteins come come back down in into the more desirable window. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Brett. And obviously noting that 16% dry matter, it's a little, little low, but I know that um, we'll park that for a slide later on in your presentation. So if you want to move us along there, please, Sarah, thanks. So good old Flaris, um, it is a mainstay of a lot of uh, perennial pastures throughout the tablelands. And in this particular paddock here, it's it's actually in the Moisture Probe paddock at uh, Cowra, just along Evan Street. You could probably, next time you're in Cowra, you can have a look at that particular paddock. They were actually trying to build a feed wedge for a, a mob of uh, wiener lambs to put on there. Um, but I, I saw this opportunity to have a look at sampling the pale coloured phalaris in this paddock as compared to the dark green coloured phalaris. And, and that's shown up in the test results, obviously, seeing that 73 digestibility of the pale coloured versus the 70, well, nearly 78% digestibility of the dark green. And um, if you have a look at that photo, you can see different patches in there. And, um, you know, normally this time of year, you're driving past a lot of paddocks and you see the dung and urine patches from, from cows. Um, potentially, I, I would suggest, Brett, that um, in this case, it's, it's all sheep that I know have been grazing that paddock. I think it's more to do with the, the sparseness of uh, legume content in this particular paddock and could be something to do with the, the soil health, whether it be pH or low phosphorus or sulphur. Um, giving that, I guess, patchwork style clover content. And, and that's obviously relating to less nitrogen in the soil, equating to that lower um, protein percentage, as you can see in that pale, 11.2 uh, versus the 19.7. And Brett, I think you had something there to talk about in terms of that ME and that pale coloured phalaris in relation to the crude protein. Is there something you'd like to add with that? Yeah, definitely, Phil. Obviously, too, like you, there's a bit of a growth potential with with that lower protein. How much are you missing uh, as far as kilograms produced? But um, f for interest's sake, Sarah and I actually ran the two pastures here, the green uh, sample, the test out 77.7 .7 with the 12 ME and 19.7 in comparison to uh, the 
sample of lower digestibility, slightly lower energy and, and lower protein. And normally when we talk about protein, we've talked about the upper limits, you know, there can be those little issues, but normally we'd like to see for a balanced ration, balanced diet, that the, the protein is at least two units generally above um, the, the energy. When we actually put both these pastures in into a, uh, a, a growth predicting model, uh, grass feed, when we ran through and ran through the scenarios with what we saw there, just the difference in quality between those feeds was equated for a 300 kilo British bred steer, so somewhere in the vicinity of about 100 grams a day weight gain difference between the two. Um, once we actually went and fixed up that protein, we saw them performing very similar. So definitely, you know, those light off patches, it, it, um, you know, we talked about the cost on the top end for having too much protein. By far and away, some of the big issues was when we're underdoing it with those levels of protein. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Brett. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. Oh, a couple of my favourites, perennial ryegrass, obviously used a lot in the tablelands. However, that particular woodstock perennial ryegrass paddock was quite interesting. Uh, Richard Parks and I went out and sampled that particular one. We did a quadrant cut and five and a half tonne of green in that particular paddock. Um, I did sort the dead and green, and I think from memory, I think there's only about 12% uh, dead leaf material in that in that particular sample. Um, fantastic performing ryegrass paddock, that particular one. It was some of the growers' own seed uh, that they'd sown, uh, probably two to three times the normal rate of perennial ryegrass that we would recommend. Therefore, the tillering was just through the roof. Unbelievable paddock. Um, obviously, 11 ME compared to 12.3 and just a little bit back on the protein when you compare it with that cephala perennial ryegrass on the left. However, that uh, to give you a bit of context, uh, that is on lighter soils, whereas the Woodstock one is probably a clay loam from memory, whereas the cephala one had uh, a big dump of biosolids incorporated into it. So uh, those biosolids give pretty much close to a lifetime of phosphorus and a heck of a lot of nitrogen and perennial ryegrass is, is just the grass to produce and, and suck out a lot of that nitrogen out of the soil. So it's uh, it is a real winner there. Obviously perennial ryegrass does struggle throughout the hot summers. Um, and for that reason on the central west slopes, you see it persisting a lot less. Um, however, these were producing and pumping a heck of a lot of green biomass and doing really well. Sarah, next one. Another favourite is chicory, and I think it is one of those um, underutilised pasture plants. In this particular case, it was sown in a mix, I think with prima gland um, clover. That's the flower that you see in the photo down below there. Uh, that's on the Tugong acid soil site um, that uh, New South Wales DPIRD Matt, um, Matt Newell, researcher, doing some trials on that. And that is a new um, new pasture that was sown in May from memory. Um, obviously, chicory won't be grazed until about that, pretty sure it's the seven true leaves uh, when it's first been put in. And all of the um, advice that comes out is, is around that 20 to 30 centimetres, 25 centimetres um, grazing height before you put the stock in. And it really responds well to that rotational grazing. That digestibility is extremely high. Obviously, um, yeah, a lot of people call it rocker fuel, 85%. However, potentially, I'm not sure if it was quite rooted by that stage, but uh, when sowing chicory, obviously just do the pull test and make sure that that chicory's um, okay and the cattle won't pull it out or sheep won't pull it out. Beautiful crude, crude protein there and energy at 13.4, just excellent. Livestock tucker. That plantain at Spices Creek, again at the Central West Local Land Services trial site there. Uh, fantastic to see them having a gut a few herbs. The tonic plantain, I think it might have been quite a bit older, might be over a year old uh, in this case. 
however it, it does play a role obviously um, uh, a little bit different to your normal loosen and um, has that really good winter activity compared to the chicory being a lot more summer active excellent crude protein that me just a little bit down but um, could be something to do with the way it's i guess not quite managed correctly grazing wise um, the more you let that uh, plantain get up in height the more of the stem is in there and that energy and digestibility will go down a little bit but still it is very very good feed at 74 75 percent digestibility next slide sarah right oh, very good um one of my favorite native grasses would be the wallaby grass um it, it there's just so many species out there uh, working on the panuara evergrace grazing management experiment we had you know i guess a lot of farmers call it by the name of white top so that that was that particular wallaby grass was right up the tops of the hills um filling in those those really shallow soils and gravelly soils uh, it was holding that soil together doing a really good job through to down in the bottoms of the slopes a wallaby grass that um, it actually has a leaf a lot uh, fleshier or a lot wider nearly nearly as big as a, as a fescue but definitely not quite that big but um, there are so many different varieties of wallaby grass that are suited to different landscapes throughout the tablelands but you can see that digestibility that is quite a bit down and Sarah did mention the uh, traffic light system uh, before and obviously that's you know getting a little bit closer to maintenance um, feed rather than growing animals out um, and I'm pretty sure that might have been not quite all green so there might have been a bit of dead in there so that's dropping that digestibility down whereas I know from experience wallaby grass if you select if you, when you're sampling and you just pull out the the uh, green leaves it does test up extremely well however that that provides a problem for the animals uh, they can't just select those green leaves and often they have a lot of dead leaves in amongst it so that um, that average probably is what a lot of those stock particularly cattle are eating the slender rat's tail grass that is a c4 sorry wallaby grass is a cool season perennial grass but slender rat's tail grass is a c4 or a summer growing grass um, so again you're probably getting quite a few dead stalks in that particular sample given that digestibility is so low below 60 percent and that em energy is dropping back down to that uh, maintenance rate of seven uh, it is a little bit higher than that but i'm sure there would have been some green in that particular sample i didn't take that one i'm not quite sure maybe sarah did you have anything um, more you want to add to that slender rat's tail sample at all um i think you're right there feel like the sample was sent off as a bit of a mixture we couldn't get all of the dead out so that's why the results are a little bit lower than to be expected um just because it was a bit hard to split at the time yeah very good thanks for that clarification i do remember taking some uh dead stalks at come knock there of slender rat's tail and I'm pretty sure I I might have beaten the cardboard record too on on the digestibility. It was terrible. Um, it does tend to take over in some cases. Anecdotally, I've seen out in the paddock where there's uh, long rest periods. It tends to enjoy those long rest periods and, and spreads. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Uh, the red grass, obviously a main staple of a lot of um, unarable paddocks out there. It does provide some pretty decent green leaf but is pretty keen to put up a seed head and therefore yeah, very quickly reduces that um, leaf to stem ratio and you see that digestibility dropping down fairly quickly as you get towards Christmas January February however if you do get those summer storms it will respond with some green leaf down low um, obviously sheep are more able to select that green leaf rather than cattle thanks Sarah do you want to move to the next one Oh, very good. I I just took this sample uh, as you know one of those pastures that it's, has its place. Um, tall wheatgrass is often planted in those saline scald areas. Uh, this particular one near Cumnock, out on the Gumble Road, there's quite a bit of salinity in, in that area, and the the farm owner actually did the right thing, planted uh, Phalaris uh, a little bit up the slope and 
and planted quite a bit of tall wheat grass right on the edge of its gold and and spread out tall wheat grass wherever it could actually grow. Um, it's actually tested up quite well, which really surprised me, Brett. Like when I was plucking those green leaves, it was like plucking, I don't know, like a razor wire or something. Not razor, but it was very, very tough um, grass. And, and I certainly, if I was an animal, I certainly wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want to put my, wrap my tongue around it to try and get some off it. Is there anything you'd like to uh, add around that palatability of different grasses, Brett? Uh, Phil, I think the photo next to it uh, definitely tells the story. You can see that the animals, when they are in their grazing, are preferentially grazing everything else. Um, it's being left there because of the abrasiveness of it, the toughness. Um, we know that generally when we talk about palatability, it's the quality that drives intake. But then there's some overriding factors. Um, and definitely with tall wheatgrass, we know that abrasiveness of them when they try to eat it, they'll tend to shy away from it and eat other things, even though, as we can see, at, you know, 72% digestibility, 112 and 162 um, crude protein. It's it's really good. The other classic example is is Yorkshire fog. Feel, um, where we will see animals preferentially graze against it, won't touch it, they'll eat everything else like that. But when we do cuts with Yorkshire fog, it comes back and tests the house down. But, you know, it's all to do with that hair, that that feel on that. So palatability is a bit hard one to, to uh, work out, but definitely things like that abrasiveness, things like that really do um, steer animals away from some feeds over others. Yeah, excellent, Brett. Obviously, um, that's probably a good thing in this particular case because you don't want the cattle eating those huffs down too much because it's doing a great job holding that soil together and, and uh, reducing any more erosion potential around that salt skull. Thanks, Sarah. Right now, we've got some paddock weeds. Obviously, Yorkshire fog, great segue. Thanks, Brett. Um, yeah, you can see that digestibility uh, of that Yorkshire fog is is quite decent and the energy is in those double figures and, and a nice balance of that crude protein as well. Uh, it, it tends to be a grass that is naturalised. It's not, as far as I know, it's not planted at all. It tends to love the, the wetter areas. So the last three to four years uh, in some places of the central tablelands, it's, it's grown in area. Uh, as soon as we get a few dry years, it will retract back to those wetter areas. Um, however, uh, I have heard the same thing about that palatability. Uh, in fact, um, once you make it into hay or silage, Brett, it tends to be pretty damn good quality. Have you heard the same? Yeah, definitely. And and in fact, oh, there's a few producers that, that I know that have deliberately turned it into hay so that they uh, have got a option with it because it turns into hay, that little hair knocks off and then they tend not to have the issue with the palatability and stock love it. And of course it is a cool season perennial, so I um, don't have to worry about that particular grass. Tussocks dying off in summer, it will stay there. However, barley grass, um, we do have quite a bit of barley grass, particularly in the mixed farming areas, and it does provide pretty damn good leaf material in those winter months and uh, a lot of people do graze it quite well especially sheep producers however it does provide a real issue for uh, sheep's eyes and contamination in wool and potentially into the carcass and there's pretty big discounts no doubt bred for those sort of skins uh, that digestibility is um, obviously quite a lot lower in, and as Sarah mentioned right at the start Look at that um, as you go up to uh, late maturity and seeding, uh, you see that digestibility and that energy and crude protein drop very substantially. So while it is um, a part of the Tablelands livestock diet, obviously we're, we're doing our best to try and um, uh, reduce the amount of annuals that we have in our pastures to make room for, obviously Flaris moves wider quite a bit, and um, and Coxfoot will 
spread by uh, new seedling growth. So, and we'd love to see more clover in those gaps instead of barley grass. Same with cut cape weed. We do see sheep and cattle eating the cape weed. Um, however, being an annual, um, as soon as Christmas comes around, that's potentially bare ground and prone to wind and sheet erosion uh, once that cape weed's done. So yeah, that crude protein is quite high. Uh, there was quite a big percentage of that seed head and stalk in that particular sample. And I do know that cape weed is another example of, um, I guess, a yellow flowering plant. And I have seen sheep go into those sort of paddocks and preferentially graze that yellow seed head first. Next slide, please, Sarah. Back to you, Brett. Back to me. Next All slide, yours. please, Sarah. <laughs> um, look, uh, we're going to go through a few things. Um, we're going to look at the livestock performance side of things of some of these pastures. Uh, I would acknowledge the, the amount of work that's gone into by the team across across the the central tablelands in taking these cuts. It's it's really been terrific, and and Sarah for getting it all together and and uh, putting it on tonight. Um, once again, you know, remember back to Sarah's original slide. She talked about the the quality of the food. We talked about the digestibility, and this one here is a pretty good example. This is a Phalaris Coxfoot sub subclover mix. Um, more than a, plenty of feed available there. It's got that height. The digestibility at 77.3 ME of almost 12, crude protein 24. Dry matter on that at 17. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it was interesting, and, and I see that there's a question in, in the chat there about grass feed. And this animal performance is, is being used as... Uh, been predicted from grass feed. So it's a, a program that we use when we're trying to model uh, animal performance and intake from different feeds because there's lots of things that go into what makes those animals perform, uh, different growth models, et cetera, et cetera. But it's one that we look at for the quality of the feed, how much they're going to eat depending on the height, the availability, et cetera, et cetera. In that, you can see here with this feed here, uh, the program grass feed we've used. This is a British bred cow, 600 odd kilos British bred cow. She's lactating. And we've used this as an example because we've got a lot of people with animals around about that stage. They're in lactation, bulls have been out, et cetera, et cetera. But if we look at this, at that stage when we ran this through the model, that cow was putting on 0.8 of a kilo a day. Its milk yield is, is 13.2 kgs. And the calf is gaining at roughly 1.5 kgs a day, so really hooting along. And you would expect that on this type of pasture. We know with the legume component in there that our intakes are going to be right up there. This is at the top end that I'd really be looking at some of the performance that we'd get from some of our animals. Next slide, thanks. This is a really interesting one, uh, Ceradella. I, I, what I would do is put a little caveat here if you ever get into paddocks at Ceradella. It's one of my more spectacular stuff-ups with estimating qualities of pasture involved Ceradella when I first kicked off as a young livestock officer. I think I created a great deal of humour. Uh, because of the Ceradella, the way, the denseness of it, uh, the volume of it, the and and the 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 stemminess of it if you like uh tend to when we look at it, tend to underestimate the kilograms of it uh dry matter per hectare wise but what i would say is you can see this this is on a place um to the north of golgong the digestibility is at roughly around about 70 percent 10.3 me crude protein 15.9 um you can see, you know, it's got that height and availability. You can see that black box, which is one of our clipper box, which is a bit over 30 centimetres high. So plenty of height. This paddock actually had ewes that were in there lactating and, and Sarah was kind enough to do a run for us here, looking at how we'd expect the performance of these ewes. So if we look at this at, at uh, crossbred single ewe, uh, ewe with a single lamb at foot, that you would be gaining sort of in the vicinity of around about 120 to 130 grams a day. It's pumping out a fair bit of milk as you would expect on this quality of feed. That lamb, single lamb would be gaining at 300, 
332 grams a day. You know, so pretty good weight gain. If we're looking at a, a, at a twin situation, um, obviously that use milking more, that stimulus from the milking effect and the like. Um, and But we're still seeing those lambs, so the weight gains left less, and, and that's why it's critical when we talk about scanning for singles and, and doubles and trying to manage, manage those animals. You can see very simply with that grass feed run how important it is. You can see the, the lamb there, the twins are putting on roughly around about 260, 270 grams a day. So some very good performance off this Ceredella on on what what is some of the some poorer acidy com, country we tend to find Ceredella. So yeah, you know, some great performance. Next slide, Sarah. Okay, this this one's an interesting one, and and this paddock uh, is in between Mudgy and Golgong. Uh, arrow leaf clover, white clover, digit and rye. Uh, I know I was dealing with the producers that that had this this on their property. Uh, I know there was some consultation about bloat and risks, um, and and it's something that uh, the district vets and myself have been talking about managing that. Um, we did see this when we were started to uh, take this sample that, that we'd started to see it up. These animals had been on there and obviously we were telling them to be very, very careful how they introduced these animals and, and what they did and when they didn't. What I would say is when we've got a feed mix like this, uh, it's a, energy is around about 13 megajoules, uh, crude protein at, at 21, uh, dry matter at 23. We're expecting some pretty red hot performance. Uh, I know uh, that, that Sarah went through and has done um, uh, a weaner um, intake, two kilos, weaner's gaining at, at three, 360, 370 grams a day, Hereford Angus steer. Look, long and the short of it, we would expect animals to gain at 100% of their potential growth at, with these numbers, right up there on the top end of performance. So, you know, that's, we're going to get, maximum performance yes there is a little bit of risk of bloat um, but in this paddock looking at it and being in it these animals have been introduced right managed properly and and the risk was relatively low because of the way it was being managed and the fact that we're starting to see a bit more flowering on the, some of this we also know arrow leaf clover is less bloat causing um, than than others but what i would say the other caveat on top of that is that uh, if we look at the hierarchical things that cause bloat, we know Western medics are right up the top, followed by white clover. So it is always something to be mindful of. Uh, but uh, as a producer once said to me, he said, if I'm blowing a couple, he said, I'm also getting a lot of weight gain. Not that I'm recommending blowing up cattle with bloat, but uh, it's, it's definitely an indicator that we're getting some very, very good performance. Next slide, Sarah. Okay, this is one, and Phil's referenced it a couple of times, looking at some of that dry matter percentages and the stuff. This is that chicory at, at um, Spices Creek, and it's one of those ones that I get asked the question about fairly regularly, how wet's too wet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and really, it's, it's one of those ones that we talk about that the moisture content will start to have an intake limitation effect. Um, there's some nuances around it. There's some things that we, we look at certain stages. Obviously, it's going to be more of an issue at certain stages with different classes of stock. Really high moisture content, I get quite concerned with ewes getting towards late pregnancy uh, and the like. But really, this is probably the best example, and, and thanks, Sarah, for putting this together for us. Um, if we look at this here, and if we look at the slide on the right hand side, you can see the graph that we've got there is I've looked at a 300 kilo mythical Angus steer gaining at a kilo a day with 11 ME. Now to gain at that weight gain, that animal needs to eat 6.86, uh, 6.8 kilograms of dry feed at 11 megajoules of energy. At 30% dry matter, that means that animal would have to consume on a wet basis 22 to 23 kilos of feed as fed. Once we drop down to roughly around about 20% dry matter, still not going to have that 6.68 to get that kilo a day, 
we blow out to 33.4 kgs. Where we really start to see some issues start to kick in at roughly around about that 18, 19, uh, 18 to 17 percent dry matter, you can really see that that starts to lift, that the 300 kilo steer is having to eat 39, nearly 40 kilos as fed. So this is a 300 kilo steer, so over 10 percent of its live weight of consumed feed during that day. We get up to 14% is where we really start to see some intake limitations kick in because of that moisture content. And all of a sudden, that's where that animal to gain a kilo a day, it'd have to eat 47 to 48 kilograms. And once it got to 10%, you can see that for that animal to gain at that 11 me at, at a kilo a day, we're well over 65 kgs as fed. So you can really see those limitations kick in. So what we tend to see is animals starting to underperform once we get to that 17, 18, uh, 17, 16, 15 and the like, just purely because they can't eat enough to gain that weight. So we'll tend to see them slipping back in, in the kilograms or the weight gain per head per day. So it just really is one to be aware of. Um, and, and, and just keep in the back of your mind how wet the feed is. Usually, I tend to say it's short-lived windows here in the central tablelands, central west area. Um, I know I, growing up on the coast, we used to have bigger periods of it, but what I would say, be aware. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Look, and this goes to what Phil was talking about there before. This is a sample that was taken at, at Woodstock. It was sent away. Having a look at the sample, um, uh, and 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 trying to narrow into what's in there, we've obviously got a bit of microlina, we've got a bit of red grass, we've got some other grasses in and through there. And when we've sent the mixed sample away, you can really see that that proportion of dead that's in that feed is really going to have an effect on on that overall weight gain of those animals. So if we've just punched in those numbers of the feed as fed and don't take in selection as, as a criteria and it's, we just cut it, that's what we've fed that animal, you can see that the weight gain of a merino weather is going to be, it's going to be losing roughly around about 84 grams a day. You know, so all, almost up to 100 grams a day just on that type of feed. The practicalities of that are that, both Phil and I have done enough cuts with microlina, and I know Sarah and our team have as well, where we know that this microlina will test up really, really well on that green feed, and you can see a little bit of clover and a few other bits and pieces, and we know when we put stock out on that type of paddock that they will go through and pick a more digestible diet than what we've cut there. And we, I would suspect and I, I know that in this scenario here, those animals will go through and their ability to select that green feed will be quite good. And I would expect sheep to be putting on weight on this feed, even though the feed test is is down on the low end. So just just be a bit careful with some of those that that data. But that sheep, cattle on the other hand, their ability to select that green out in that grazing situation is going to be limited. We're going to get more of the dead in with the green. So I would suspect that their performance is going to be less and and on the lower end of what what I'd normally expect, just purely for their inability to select of, uh, a, a, the best of the best out of that feed, just like sheep would. Anything to add there, Phil? No? I, sorry, Phil. Sorry, Brad. Yeah, obviously... You know, they can be quite productive, can't they? Those uh, those native paddocks, especially now, especially in Woodstock, a lot of the uh, soft brome and annual ryegrass has has gone to head, and uh, that will allow the microlina to really um, put on some leaf if you get uh, twenty to thirty mils in a storm. So don't discount them; they can provide some really good quality feed in November, December. Yeah, particularly out of season in response to rainfall, Phil. I know you did a lot of cuts at Benoit with some of this stuff, and I know our team over the time, and I know particularly after dry pinches, some of the mineralisation, we can see some really 
incredible figures right up in that 11 plus megajoules and as we saw in in sarah's original slide up to 19 percent protein and the like so is is something just to be aware of i know in this scenario that feed sample that we sent away because it's a mix the deads dragged the green down to a huge extent next slide thanks sarah look Michaelina, here we go um it's one of those ones, we've got this one here and you can really see that. We talked about it over 11 ME, um, 75.9, uh, crude protein, 18, dry matter, 45. Uh, phenomenal feed, um, really good quality if, if it's looked after and, and fed right. Um, and look, it's one of these things that, that um, you know, we know we've got that, that good feed there. But, and, and Sarah and the, the team have done a terrific job here, we know that height in these scenarios is going to have an impact on, limita uh, in, impact on intake, that limitation, handbrake, if you like, on how much they can actually physically eat. And the best example with that little ruler on the right-hand side, you can see that the pasture height, we've got, when, when we've put it into grass feed, looking at predicting uh, the, the intake, the weight gain is roughly around about four, 400 grams a day for a 550 kilo Angus cow that's doesn't not lactating but a calf at, at foot. And the pasture intake is down at, you know, 6.8 six, um, to, to almost 7, 6.9 uh, kilograms of dry matter per day. We lift that pasture height up. We go from three centimetres up to nine centimetres, we're all of a sudden making it more available. They're able to get more per bite and time is a big factor. Limitation and fatigue, how long animals will graze for. We talk about grazing up to 11 hours, but realistically, most grazing times are eight to nine hours in a day when they, we're saying to push them. That maximum, I know looking at some, some historical data that I've looked at, really, you don't get up past that 11 too much. There's, there's, there's a whole heap of things going on. Most of the time, grazing time's between five to six hours in a day. So limiting, less per, per mouthful with that short one. Once we get up to that 15 centimetres, we're all of a sudden looking at weight gain of a kilo a day and a pasture intake of 9.52. Some of that extra weight gain that we're getting for not much change in actual intake is actually to do with the fact that because that's now higher, we're now allowing those cattle to select a more digestible diet than what they could before. So all of a sudden, higher, more available, we're able to eat better quality and then perform better. So just always have a look at that height and, and think that that's going to be a bit of a handbrake. We talk about five centimetres is, is once you start to fall under that five centimetres, it can be a real issue. Um, cattle above 10 centimetres, well, races as much as you can get. So, okay, next slide. Thanks, Sarah. Just summary to go through what, what and, and some things to consider coming up and, and into summer. Really what I would be suggesting to people and, and going around looking at a few places as I have done in the last few weeks, get out there, have a look at your pastures, your current pastures, what's there, what's not there, how much feed is and isn't there. Also check your livestock condition. We've got, you know, cows with, with calves on them, ewes with, with lambs in some areas depending on the season. Um, if you've got animals that we haven't quite got the quality of feed in front of them, a lot of the time there's no point those calves and lambs still being on there. Sometimes it's worthwhile pulling the trigger a bit earlier to wean them because we know, particularly going back to some of those performance data, if we've got ewes and, and cows that are starting to strip a little bit of fat off, losing a key, you know, sort of 500 to grams to a kilo a day and, and, and use losing 100 plus grams a day, it doesn't take long time for them to strip a fat score off. And that's got to be put back on if we're looking at joining and conception rates and, and also what level fatness we've got when we're calving and, and um, lambing next season. What I would also say is set some goals for both your pastures short and long term. Uh, I know this is one that Phil and I have discussed about some of the legume content in pastures. Phil, um, 
I, I know for myself personally, I've got a paddock at home that I absolutely duffed up because I just didn't have the stock numbers in in two, 2020, 2021. I didn't think I did that bad a job in 2020, but I found out in 2021 I did a terrible job. A um, few other things happening at that time, but anyway, I'm still wearing the consequences of that of the poorer management in that paddock now. I don't have the legume content. Um, and Phil, you complained about that little bit of yellow in, in some of those and a bit of urea patches. Um, I can tell you this paddock of mine, I can tell where the cows have all peed and all pooed. Uh, you can definitely see it. So it's one of those ones, I haven't got that legume. So I'm really now concentrating on that paddock for next year that I open it up. I've got that nutrition going in that I've got that legume content. So that's the gold for that paddock. So I think people need to go and have a look and, and as personally assess each paddock and look at long and short-term goals. The other thing too, particularly if we're getting a bit tight and, and particularly with this summer seasons with the storms, with the abs and the abs not, start to look at some fodder budgeting. Look what's in front of you, but also take into account with that fodder budget, the quality of that feed. Is that going to be enough to reach the golds critical weights, et cetera, for the animals that you've got. You know, you, you want them to hit certain targets and the like. So use fodder budget and the like. Also, if you're looking at, at not quite ticking the goals with that fodder budget, is it, you know, think about the supplementary feed. Think about the energy and protein options that are out there. If we're talking about energy, I'm really talking grain or, or pellets or the like. Um, thinking about those things. I know I was at a meeting earlier today and I was talking about about now is where I start to see this area, lots of youths going out the door with with blocks on. Not my favourite thing, as anyone knows me really well. They're very good at limiting weight loss, but at a fairly substantial cost. So if you're interested in that type of stuff, talk to us about protein supplementation. What you should have picked up, though, is that we know that we tend not to get that benefit of protein supplementation with, with sheep purely because their ability to select that highly digestible feed, that high quality feed, and we don't tend to get that. They will always chase that green pick, whereas cattle, on the other hand, we know a protein supplementation, depending how it's given, will increase intake, doesn't change the quality of the feed by 14 to 24%. So chase around. There is some information on different supplementary feeding options, but definitely the calculator, the, the drought and supplementary feed calculator is a good tool, but really, you know, look at those options if, if you haven't got the feed when you do your fodder budgets. What I would say um, is we're in the storm season. Uh, we've already started to see the, the storms kick around. Phil's already talked about it just, just this evening. We know we'll have the haves and the have-nots. Um, we will get these responses and we are in the zone here if we look historically through this area that we get those summer storms they kick in pretty much from now through to, to february is where we see those storms and you know i know uh, just talking to a consultant before i came online he's he's doing a uh, another uh, webinar later on for another group somewhere else and he was just talking about some of the predictability we know that during this summer period here, where some are storm driven through this zone very much so. So be aware of that, but be aware that we tend to pick up these storms. Phil, your thoughts? Yeah, definitely, Brett. We're probably jumping into a bit of question time, but just to summarise, I think, Brett, um, be great if you can just try and grow your own. Yeah, take advantage of some of those uh, summer growing, or warm season growing grasses. And uh, if you're seeing a bit of paleness in the leaf, well, uh, it's not all bad. You know how to fix it. Let's uh, grow a bit more herbage mass and uh, throwing a bit of nitrogen at it will actually up the protein as well. So you're going from a tropical grass that might be only 12 and uh, 14 protein to a tropical grass that will be punching the lights out in the protein, hopefully over 20 and you can grow stock on it. So have a look at those options at growing your own in the lower parts of your landscape, especially, and that's because that's where all those high intensity rainfall events will, will end up. That's where the, the deeper buckets will be. Anyway, thanks very much, Sarah, if you wanna. 
Amazing. Not Thanks, Brett and Phil. Um, we've just got a few more minutes, so I think we might be able to answer a few questions. But while we're getting ready to answer some of the questions um, that have been sent through, we would just like to ask you all if you could use your phone to scan the QR code on the screen um, and fill out our survey. This would just help us understand the value of our webinars um, and give you an opportunity to let us know what you'd like to see in the future. Um, I've also just popped back on the screen the instructions from how to qu ask questions in the Q&A tab um, and we'll get right into them. So Brett, I know you touched on Graz feed. There's just a question here, can anyone get it and is there training on it at the moment? Yeah, anyone can get it. Most of our team have got grass feed. Uh, it's something that we, we use. Um, uh, training on it, yes, look, uh, it's part of um, what we do when we do progress training. We'll teach people how to do it. Um, there, there is also the option if people want want to get it, It's you can get it off CSIRO. Um, but, yeah, definitely come and have a yarn to our staff. Come along. We, we'll, yeah. More than happy to chat people through how to use Grassfeed um, and put put useful information so you get useful information out. Amazing, thank you, Brett. Um, and Phil, there's a question here on nitrogen fixing plants. Um, would you be able to give an example of, with Vetch as an example, um, a tons per hectare kind of a, an idea, a magic number, or is that something you'd be able to help with? Yeah, there's a little bit of research out on that, Sarah. Um, however, I don't have it right here in front of me. The, I guess the the guide that a lot of people use is is between that 25 and 30, uh, five kgs um, of nitrogen being fixed into the soil, uh, given the right conditions per ton of dry matter produced by that particular legume. So. In context, obviously looking at that plantain and, and chicory that are non-legumes, um, ideally you'd have an annual legume growing alongside it to provide that uh, nitrogen so that you're limiting the amount of nitrogen you have to put on out of a bag. In fact, uh, Matt Newell in his trial down at Cara has seen some really good production out of those low methane pastures in chicory and cerradella being grown together. Um, in fact, he believes that that deep rooted uh, taproot of the chicory is actually helping the cerradella produce more biomass. So they're working in unison. Um, so it is very dependent on your soil health, uh, your soil depth, and a few other issues. And I see there is a question around vetch and how it goes in light country, and I'll just quickly address that. Uh, you don't see a lot of vetch going in in a light country, but one thing that you might want to just double check is. If you haven't grown vetch in that particular paddock before, you want to make sure that you've got enough inoculant on on those sandy soils. It's um, the rhizobia um, yeah, struggles a little bit on those sandier soils. So probably doubling that rate of rhizobia and making sure that application to the seed is, is correct. Thanks, Bill. And Brett, just lastly, if you want to touch on what the milking effect is um, before we finish up for the webinar. Uh, I, I think what we were talking about when we were looking at that milk is just simply the litres milk produced when we were doing those grass feed runs. Um, so obviously for every litre of milk to produce, it's got a fair bit extra energy costs. Uh, the numbers that we use when we do that is just a standard milker. Whereas, um, so uh, if we look at energy, we talk about you know, a cow needing, depending on the size of the animals, you know, 70 to 80 megajoules of energy per day. Uh, all of a sudden you get a high milking cow, it's not unusual, and we think about in a dairy type term, needing in excess of 120 megajoules of energy per day. Um, so yeah, you know, I think that's what they were chasing there. Um, just, yeah, just one to be aware of. Yep, perfect, thank you, Brett. Well, thank you everyone. Um, that's all about all we have time for today, but any of those unanswered questions we will send out after the webinar along with uh, the recording and the full results. So I did see a question in there about accessing the recording that will um, be published shortly after tonight and you'll be able to access it using the same email that you signed up with. But if you aren't able to access it, just send me an email and I'm happy to help. And any extra questions that you've thought of, 
feel free to send them through. But yeah, thank you everyone for attending and have a great night. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Phil. And thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you and good night.